Hello number ones, welcome back to my channel, this is The Method on Speaking and first and foremost I'd like to apologize profusely for not being able to publish videos recently and that is because I haven't been feeling very well but now I'm much better, I'll tell you more about it later. For now, let's get to the topic. Okay, so today we're talking about Roman military footwear and of course if you are a history buff, if you are into the Romans, ancient Romans and soldiers and legionaries and legions, and of course you know about the Caligae and here we have loads of different versions and I'll be doing little reviews on these different replicas to tell you, to also give a little bit of advice, we'll talk prices and where you can get them produced and pros and cons. But first I'd like to talk about the actual history of the Roman military boot. And yes, I said boot, because these are boots, these are not sandals. So do not ever call them sandals, but particularly if you're talking to historical reenactors, because they are indeed open boots. Now, these are very closely associated to the military, okay? So this is a sort of um, shoe that was designed specifically for the soldiers, and we'll get to when in a minute, and it was very well designed and it was excellently made and expertly made and we will be looking at some of the characteristics the soles and how they're made and why they're open and and also a few problems that you can have with Caligae but I'd like to start by debunking a common myth or misconception. Now we all know about the Roman emperors and of course the first emperor was Octavianus Augustus, the second one is Tiberius, the third emperor is Caligula. Now I've heard people, and I think I've seen it on some videos as well, uh, saying that uh, Caligula uh, the, invented the Caligae and therefore that's why they are called Caligae. No, it's actually the other way around. So first and foremost let's talk about the etymology, the origins of the word Caliga. So the word Caliga comes from the Latin word Callus, which literally means hard leather. So it's a shoe, a sort of boot, that was named after the material it was made of. So why was the third emperor called Caligula? Caligula is a diminutive, it means little boot. But why was the third emperor of Rome called little boot? Well this story has to do with the campaigns, military campaigns, of the first emperor Octavianus Augustus in Germany. Now, during these campaigns, at the times of Tiberius, there was already the little uh, future emperor Caligula and they used to bring him to the front with them, I suppose as a sort of way of educating the future emperor. And one of the characteristics of Gaius Julius Caesar Germanicus Augustus, that's his full name when he will become the emperor in 37 AD, um, whom we know as Caligula, is that as a kid, when he was brought to the front, he would be they, they would dress him up like a like a like a miniature soldier, we could say. So he would would have like a military dress, uh, the, the tunic, and then a small pair of Caligae. So the soldiers gave him a little nickname in a sort of a an affectionate way, and they called him Little Boots. But what's important to say is this is when Caligula was a child. So they produced small military boots, small caligae, for him when he was a child, which means that these caligae were already present and they were common for the military at the time of Tiberius and most likely they had already been around at least since the times of the first emperor, if not even earlier. Hence, although we cannot pinpoint a specific time or date, and in history, when the Caligae were used, we know that most likely they were already in use and associated to the military during the late Republic, rendering the little story of Caligula inventing them completely wrong. Okay, so what are Caligae made of? Now, according to the actual findings, the archaeological findings, we can see that they were made mostly out of two kinds of leather, either cow, uh, cow's leather or ox leather. And this leather would be tanned, vegetably tanned. Now what is interesting is to prepare, to, to, to tan the leather and cut it and create the shoe, it would take about two years of work. Why would it take so long? Well, the shoe has a rather complex structure. It might look ancient, but it's still quite advanced and particularly advanced for the time. So first and foremost, very famously, the soles are reinforced with iron pins or iron domed nails. And this is very important because the Caligae, most of the time the soldiers were marching, these are specifically designed for marching, um, had to march on what? Soil, grass, and therefore they needed better, stronger grip. Also consider the fact that the shoe has two soles which are attached by the nails and this makes it for a very strong and durable design. Although durability is the next topic we're going to talk about before we continue on the shape and some stylistic choices. 
how durable was a caliga? Well, as far as we know from, from Roman writers, we understand that generally speaking, of course, durability would depend on how much marching that specific legion did. But for a legion that was marching a lot, generally speaking, a pair of caligae would, have, would be expected to last about four months. What this means is that in one year, and every soldier would need three pairs of caligae. Okay, so let's have fun with a little bit of calculation here. We have got two shoes in a pair. A soldier needs three pairs per year, that's six boots per soldier. If we multiply that for the number of standing men in a Roman legion, we will go beyond number 30,000 boots. Now we will be using the number 36,000, which is the official number according to the calculation of Van Driel Murray. Now at the times of Julius Caesar's death, or Julius Caesar, there were 37 legions. If we multiply 36,000 by 37, we get number 1,332,000 boots. But if we fast forward to the times of Octavianus Augustus, the first emperor, then the number of standing legions was raised up to 60. Of course they were not all full strength, but just for the sake of fun. How many boots would that be? You needed 2,160,000 boots per year. Talking about joining the army for the booty. So who would have to pay for all of that? Well, the soldiers. And that is why we've got some historical records of a specific legion asking their emperor to allow them a little bit of extra money so that they could pay for the costs of all the marching that they had to, to engage in. The answer of the emperor was, if you don't want to consume your boots, march barefoot. Thank you for that. Very classy. Stylish. So who would make these? Well, this depends on what time period we're talking about, because these were very popular during the entirety of the imperial time, or at least until the 3rd century they still were in use, and then after the 3rd century we start having a sort of diversion between closed versions and open versions of military boots. Um, however, these were used for a very long time, so who would make them? Well, first and foremost we know for a fact that there are cases in which uh, soldiers were given a duty to work on shoes, so it was something that the soldiers themselves could make. This shouldn't really surprise us. I mean, at the end of the day, Roman soldiers were builders, we know that. They were explorers. They were not just fighters, they were not just warriors. They were multi-purposed and oftentimes multitasking professionals. But we also have a lot of accounts of soldiers having to go out to purchase the leather, to purchase whatever you needed to create the caliga. So they could produce them, go on errands to buy the, the raw materials. But we also know that later on in time, about the time of the conquest of Britain, even end of the first century, then there are also cases in which a soldier would just um, ask a social civilian uh, maker to start producing them and they would just pay them. So why open? Well, we mentioned there's a few sort of possible terrains where the soldiers had to march, um, the grassland, meadow, mountains, hills, and, and of course the Roman streets and soil in general. But sometimes they also had to cross mostly streams, streaks and rivers. Now, when this gets wet, because of the fact that it's all open, it also means that it's going to drain more quickly and easily. This again enhancing the durability. Also, the open pattern allows for ventilation, which also means that there will be less heat retention, which will result in less sweaty feet and also possibly less blisters. In addition, the flexible straps could be adjusted to adapt to the wearer's foot and allow for the expansion of the foot in high temperatures. If correctly made, abrasions to the feet are minimal because of the absence of pressure on toe joints, the big toe and the ankle. So the design is incredible, it's really ingenious. It also has some disadvantages. Now anyone of you who has done reenactment re and has worn some of these knows a thing or two about slippering. What I mean by that is that yes, these are perfect for the sort of soil, natural soil that I mentioned, but if you're walking on a paved floor, goodness gracious, you're going to become a champion of skiing. So was that not a problem for the Romans? Are they designed differently than they used to be? And the answer to that is no, it was a problem for the Romans as well. In fact, we've got a historical account of a battle um, in, uh, in Jerusalem, actually, as their soldiers were conquering and killing all the Jews. As they move into the temple, one of the centurions who was charging in slipped because of his caligae and gets killed. So what did they do to fix it? Well, this the fact that it was recorded probably is the fact that it almost never happened. At the end of the day, most soldiers would fight in forests or, or meadows. I mean, that was just a single occasion, I suppose, but of course, palace guards would probably have no nails. Now, one thing that you might be thinking is, but why three pairs of boots 
per year rather than just repairing a single pair of boots? And that is difficult to answer, but we know that they didn't. I mean, as we move forward later on, and perhaps you are in Britannia and you don't really have the means for whatever reason, no supply and whatnot, and then uh, to, to get new shoes and yours are still okay, you haven't been marching too much, then yeah, sure, whatever. I suppose that repair, repairing could be done. In fact, we've got records of, of soldiers buying new nails, some of them actually buying a lot of nails for, um, for the actual, for the, for the sole, for the outside of the sole repairing. But we still know that it was most common throughout human, uh, Roman history to just throw them away after three, three to four months and just get a new pair. The reason for that, not really sure, but if they did it, I suppose it was quicker and remember that. Roman soldiers, it's a war fighting machine, the, the legion I mean, and therefore efficacy, once you've got the money, um, is more important and most likely also if the boots were really really ruined, you didn't really save up that much. Although this is interesting, because normally when we look at medieval times, and if we look at other things like tunics and whatnot, then the, 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 the ancients were very different to the way we are and are medieval people. We modern people throw away everything. Whenever something is a little crooked, throw it away. Instead, medieval people, Roman people, Greeks and whatnot, they would repair a lot and recycle. And even like Roman tunics, when they were completely destroyed, um, you, you could just cut them and create, and you know, slice them a little bit and use them to create socks, to create bandages, or even repurpose some of the best parts, the best preserved parts, in order to turn them into focalia or scarves. So yes, they did, but with the boots, it's an exception. They would just get new ones. So, I mentioned the Jews, Jerusalem, and there is one very, very interesting piece of information that we have from Jewish records who mention the sort of footwear used by the Romans. Now, here's the thing. So, the Romans wore the nails underneath the sole, we know that, and these make a very specific noise, particularly when we're talking about a full legion on the march. You can hear them coming. In fact, the Jewish knew that whenever they would hear the smashing of iron nails against cobbles, then the Romans were coming, which also equals to trouble is coming. Now, this was so important to them that we know that we've got uh, writings of Jewish writers of the time mentioning that the local Jewish population was forbidden to wear nailed shoes so that you could identify immediately by the sound the Romans coming. See how close the association between this sort of shoe and the Roman military was. It's fascinating. And also another mention of military boots worn by the Roman soldiers from the perspective of the uh, dominated and conquered Jews is the idea of don't you ever insult Roman soldiers because if you do he's gonna kick you in the shin and it's gonna hurt a lot because of the nails. Alright, all of this is impressive but here is lots of different repl replicas. Here we have lots of different replicas. What is the difference? Well, first and foremost, of course, the price. And I sort of set them in a way as to show you the least expensive ones. You can get these from Battle Merchant or pretty much any um, online store that produces Roman stuff. Um, these as well you can get from these stores. But these, these are handmade and tailored by a very very good juicer um, who's also the one that made my roman armor called fabrica cacti which i strongly suggest and you will find a link in the description below okay so these are handmade the pattern of the nails is is based on fi findings actual findings and also they are tailored and this is really important i mean i could wear these all day well these others are given that they're not uncomfortable i mean generally speaking roman shoes and footwear is extremely comfortable again if you don't walk with it in your lovely paved room after your mother cleaned the floor but these when when you get them tailored is just another thing the only thing you gotta be careful though is that with the leather it will rub on your skin and it might you know there might be a little bit of slithering so you might want to cover yourself up it's, it's my suggestion use bandages and and protect your skin from from all the rubbing if you're intending on marching on it a lot so if you are on a budget I'm gonna say yeah you can go for these cheaper ones they still look good I mean it's not as as bad as wearing a, a piece of armor that is completely untailored you know if, if you only have budget to tailor one thing then get your armor tailored but if you do have a little extra budget then it is so much worth to just get the shoes right as well and they just look so much better that I'm gonna say absolutely go for Fabrica Cacti or any other producer you might know
I still haven't fully recovered from a um, nine to ten days of flu that I had, lots of fever, antibiotics and uh, cortisone and whatnot. Um, so that's why I haven't been uploading. I've been waiting to get better, but at this point I thought, you know, I'm just going to make a video, I'm just going to make it simpler, just specifically for the noble ones who are really the core of my audience, who are really history buffs. Because generally speaking now, when I make a video, even if it's a sort of historical lecture, I still try to make it as entertaining as possible, changing the shots and, and whatnot, and with a lot of editing and lots of images all the time because unfortunately unless you talk to history buffs like I know you are but sometimes when I need to attract newer audience or younger audience audiences they don't really have much of an attention span and so I do need to try and entertain them as much as educate them and I don't mind I really like highly edited videos but today I wasn't really feeling up for it because I'm not 100% in fact now I'm gonna go back to bed I'm gonna edit this tomorrow and uh, and I hope that I haven't made you wait too long but next video and let me know what you like you know I might be thinking about other sort of items within the Roman and medieval within Roman and medieval times maybe sort of I don't know tunics underwear well let me know in the comments below thank you very much for watching and remember the Metatron spread his wings Valete.